so happy to be here tonight. This talk was supposed to take place a year ago and it got canceled and then it got rescheduled and I'm so happy to see that there's so many friends in the audience, people that I have known for many years. Um, and I, as I was presenting, the, as I was working on this presentation, um, I decided to make notes and really think about um, who am I as a curator. So instead of reciting, you know, I'm not going to talk, I, I'll, I'm going to share lots of exhibitions, of course, and projects, but I'm not going to go through each section of the show. I'm not going to talk about the artist's biography necessarily, except maybe one big artist that was impactful in my career. And so, you know, when I thought about my own career, it's like, well, what, what do I love? And, you know, as a, as a child, I love, I've always loved popular culture, pop culture. You know, this included toys and comics and um, tabloids, but I also love, you know, current affairs and history and music. And so this has really been fundamental to the way that I've become a curator. Um, my own practice, and you'll see as, we show, as I show you different examples, um, I'm really into material culture. Um, I'm in, interested in anything that's re research focused, whether it's something research from something that's very contemporary or of the moment, or if it's historical. Um, I'm also a maximalist, so I love, you know, I love color. Uh, you can tell from this detail from this artist, Farhad Moshiri, that I love things that are very colorful, pop, attractive, uh, seductive. Um, and so I think, you know, when I left Miami, I worked at the Bass Museum of Art, and many of you have been there. Um, the last exhibition that I did was the, the show titled Gold, and some of the artists are actually here in the room. And I think that really summarizes, you know, where I was then. And so I, I still have continued in that uh, trajectory. You know, Gold had a reference to old and new historical, but certainly new work and contemporary. My own background is in contemporary art, but I work in many different disciplines now. Um, I'm extremely collaborative. I love working with artists, curators, other institutions, organizations. Um, I want art to be accessible. I don't like fanning through art magazines and it's so dense, I don't even know what it's talking about. Um, so I like art to be really appealing and, and populous. Um, and so I'm gonna start off my talk from when I left the Bass. Instead of going chronological, I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna mix it up instead of starting from, from my earliest careers as a curator and start off when I left Miami. So I left Miami and I actually joined um, the Andy Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh. And so um, the Andy Warhol Museum, it's part of the uh, uh, Carnegie Museums of Pittsburgh. So this is four museums, if you've, some of you have actually been there and have visited me. Um, but the Andy Warhol Museum is there because Andy Warhol was born there and he ended up moving to New York City and kind of is thought of as a New Yorker. Um, but at some point in the, after Warhol died in 87, the foundation gifted everything uh, to the Carnegie Museums of Pittsburgh and then the building was made and that's how everything ended up there. And so it was really great for me to join uh, the Warhol Museum is, is that it also um, has a, if you go there, it has sort of the chronological life of Andy Warhol but also it has a floor that allows us to do temporary shows and connecting Warhol uh, with contemporary artists, living artists. Um, and it's because the Warhol Museum doesn't collect anything but Warhol. So if you visit there, there might be a, temp a contemporary project, but it's not part of the Warhol Museum's collection. So if you go there, you'll only see Warhol uh, paintings, films, things like that. And so the first project that I did in, in terms of contemporary was to um, think about popular culture pop and look east. And so I decided to work with an artist named Farhad Moshiri. Farhad Moshiri is an artist who's still based in Tehran, in Iran. And he, um, I got to work with him, and this is just an example of the show. It's his only museum uh, show in the, in the United States. There's a catalog for this. But it was an opportunity to really talk about his work because he looks at Iran's traditions um, and historical isolationism, but it also acknowledges the appeal and the influence of Western culture. And so he was born in Shiraz, Iran, but he spent most of his time um, in his young adulthood in the United States and had left um, prior to the Iranian Revolution. And so when I was working with him on the exhibition, I got to, um, he, he was able to come to Pittsburgh, actually. He has a dual nationality. And so the paintings you see here, they're, they're these sort of clay vessels. They're, they look like clay vessels. They're oil paintings, and they're, they're cracked canvases to look like um, cracked vases or vessels. And they're actually um, in Farsi, but they're um, the different flavors of different, like ice creams. And so most of these paintings actually came from Tehran, from his uh, studio. We ended up shipping them from Iran to Dubai, Dubai to Paris, and Paris to Pittsburgh. And so we were able to stretch them at the Warhol Museum and include them in the show. Most of you would probably remember his work um, 
has been extremely, oops. most of you might remember his work by seeing it like in the art fairs. They're highly densely beaded um, works that are covered um, that represent sort of comic books or um, greeting cards. Um, he's also known for creating these paintings which are kitchen knives or these blades um, that are embedded in um, oil paint that look like cake frosting. And so we were able to also borrow um, these works. And this sort of gives you a sense of the materiality of um, his visuals that he's interested in, but also the opportunity to work with an artist such as Farhad um, at the Warhol Museum. He was not able to come for the opening, but we made a catalog and we talked about issues uh, between Iran and the United States. And that was part of um, the efforts to really open up conversations that are not just merely whimsical or charming. And when I think of popular culture, it doesn't need to be funny and lighthearted. It can certainly tackle um, serious issues um, taking place in the United States. And for me, the real allure to Farhad was his connection uh, to pop. This is another example. He uses uh, paint, um, but he puts it in like the, um, in the piping bags like you would do for like uh, cakes. And so he, if you look at them up closely, they look extremely decorative and delicious, um, but they're actually um, paintings. And the imagery on the, this particular work is based off um, like greeting cards. They sort of have a, a vintage look to them because it would have been vintage uh, greeting cards that he has amassed during his own youth when he was growing up uh, in Iran. In terms of working at the Warhol Museum, uh, my interest also became one uh, interested in ephemera and film. And so working at the Warhol Museum, I'm able to dig through um, the archives and look at films. You can't go to YouTube and see a Warhol film necessarily. You'll see like bootlegs. Um, but also it allows me to explore the collection and come up with new uh, narratives or untold stories. Um, in the last couple of years, I've been able to use the floors at the museum to not only talk about Warhol, but talk about his friends, his peers. You know, a lot of people tend to talk about Warhol and the people around him, but uh, there's been lots of opportunities in the last few years to, to really highlight uh, individuals who are pretty spectacular uh, for their own accomplishments. And so um, the image on the left there, it's, uh, I did a, I did a gallery uh, just dedicated to the singer, uh, Grace Jones, and so we had all these party invitations. She was a performer, a model that had um, spent some time in Paris. Um, we did a gallery dedicated to um, the image on the far right. Uh, the woman is named Donna Jordan. She was one of these early uh, models from the 70s, and she also was um, uh, discovered by a really important uh, Puerto Rican illustrator named Antonio Lopez. And for that project, I was able to go to Jersey City uh, Antonio Lopez's archive is available. Um, you can go there and have access to this. Um, but it was an opportunity because Donna Jordan's still alive. She's pretty much a recluse. Um, and it was a, an opportunity to talk about um, people that were very active uh, during this period. Um, and then um, the image on the top right is, a, is an actor from uh, an international film actor named Max Delis, who died mysteriously. You could try to Google it. Um, but he was in a lot of uh, several Warhol films and a friend of, um, uh, of Karl Lagerfeld, who appears in some of the photos there. So I wanted to give you an example of sort of the tools that I'm working with when I'm at the Warhol Museum. Uh, this was the last show that I did with them. This was at the um, Ullen Center of Contemporary Art in Beijing. Um, I w it was, uh, it took place in Beijing and then went to Shanghai. Um, one thing that really um, highlights me as a curator is I, I love to work with exhibition designers. So when you see these pops of color, you see these beautiful, the beautiful architectural features. Um, that's something that I think about when I work with artists, when I work with a collection. Um, this exhibition, it was in China, but they're able to just build everything. We don't need to ship any pedestals, any custom, uh, um, custom uh, um, um, metal or platforms. They built everything and with, within a very fast period of time. Um, this exhibition was focused around um, Andy Warhol sort of ch from his childhood all the way to his death. And so this gallery really covers sort of that silver factory, um, sort of the key moment of what we tend to know Warhol for. Um, Andy Warhol, of course, he's known for his soup cans and Marilyn Monroe paintings, but he was also an avant-garde filmmaker. Um, you'll notice um, the films that are sort of projected at the upper top. But this gallery, this is just adjacent to it, this talks about the Pittsburgh years. So he went to, he was Carpetho Rusin. Um, the Warhola family still lives in Pittsburgh. Um, it's a Byzantine Catholic family. And so that really sparked my interest about who you know, Warhol was um, 
pre-fame or before people knew who he was. And this gallery is really dedicated around that. And it's really sparked a lot of my um, interests when I was at the Warhol Museum, um, really investigating um, the life and times of Andy Warhol. A lot of people will know uh, Warhol for his, oh, sorry, my notes just vanished. A lot of people will know Warhol for his appropriation of imagery, and so the, the biggest or most important show I, I ever did and probably will ever do about Warhol um, was an exhibition um, titled Revelation. Um, it, was meant, it was actually meant to be uh, um, presented at the Vatican Museums in Italy. And so when this project started, the curator of the Vatican, so if you go to the Vatican City, there's 27 different collections. So the whole structure is the, is the Vatican Museums. And so I worked with their curator of modern and contemporary. If you go there, they actually do have an incredible collection of modern and contemporary. It's very much focused on abstraction, the sublime. Um, and so there was an idea to do an Andy Warhol exhibition there. He had actually gone to the Vatican in 1980, met Pope John Paul II. Uh, the Last Supper paintings were premiered and exhibited in, um, in Italy, and he died about a month later. And so this was sort of a many years project that I had worked on. And so I had gone twice to the Vatican to work on this exhibition, sort of back of house. It was uh, going to be a cur co-curated effort. And so working on this exhibition, it, was, it also had its disappointments and challenges because the Vatican chose to not be involved. One day, we just sort of got a Dear John letter and said, oh, we can't be involved anymore. We, it's getting uh, complicated. It's the 500th anniversary of Leonardo da Vinci. We're going to do that instead. And there was some negative press that came out that, oh, we're, the Vatican's going to show a queer artist. You know, if you look, if you really Google him, it's not just about The Last Supper. It's not just about um, Rorschach paintings or things that are just abstract or camouflage paintings. And the show wasn't, in, the show wasn't intention, intentionally going to show that work. So I'm, I'm convinced. Um, that the exhibition would have been completely different, but we decided to commit to the exhibition, and so the exhibition is ultimately mine uh, to work on, and I just wanted to show some examples of what that uh, exhibition um, included. As I worked on the exhibition, I also brought on board uh, two other museums, and so the exhibition, um, we got commitment from the Speed Art Museum, so Miranda Lash, uh, who's at the, at the MOCA in Denver, now with Leilani Lynch, if you know her from the Bass, um, the Speed Art Museum in Louisville, Louisville, Kentucky committed to the show early, and so she was able to write for the catalog. And then the Brooklyn Museum also committed to the exhibition, and Carmen Hermo, um, another curator uh, who's up and coming, uh, committed to the show too. So all three of us were these lapsed Catholics uh, working on this exhibition and really coming up with uh, a narrative that could really resonate to like audiences of today. From my own research, I was really dedicated to Andy Warhol's mother, Julia Warhola. So just to, again, I don't want to show you each section of the exhibition, but I want to show the, the beauty of being, having access to things when you're able to research. Um, Julia Warhola was a self-taught artist. She lived with her son for like 20 plus years. Um, she uh, illustrated only two things in her life as an artist, cats and angels. And so a lot of that really became um, unpacking the archives, finding not only that, but source materials, personal effects, ephemera. Here we have uh, um, some souvenirs from the visit to the Vatican. We also have some personal, um, um, some Polaroids of some studies that were never uh, used for any sort of paintings. And then taking that and then translating it into uh, an experience for audiences. Um, if any of you saw the Cause exhibition in the Brooklyn Museum, that was the show that was before this one. They just reversed the exhibition design. So instead of starting where the cause show started, you started on the opposite end. Um, but they were able to come up with a really beautiful exhibition design, uh, recreating the, the Byzantine Catholic Church where Warhol went as a child. It's still in Pittsburgh. And we were able to um, borrow, I was able to borrow the icon paintings on the left. They're actually from the, um, from the church. They saved them. They have new ones now. Um, but they actually saved them. So those are the ones that Warhol, as a child, would have seen when he was at church. And he went to church uh, for his whole entire life. But I wanted to highlight, um, thinking about Warhol, a lot of, um, because he's such a figurative artist, a lot of people gravitate towards The Last Supper and um, you know, unpacking like the Marilyn Monroe paintings, how they relate to religion. I decided to, or I sort of wanted to pick up on um, a project that Warhol did that a lot of people didn't know about or only a few scholars knew about. 
Warhol had a large presence in World's Fairs, if you think about the 1963-64 World's Fair um, in the, with the Philip Johnson Pavilion. He also was in the Expo Montreal. Uh, there's an image on the, far, on the top left, that's with the de Menil family. And so um, Warhol, Warhol was included in a project for a World's Fair in San Antonio. It was called the Hemisphere 1968. And so, the Archbishop in San Antonio uh, actually contacted the Vatican and wanted to create a, a religious or ecumenical pavilion for the 68 World's Fair. And so to do that, the, the diocese actually contacted the Vatican and the Vatican was super interested. And they worked with the de Menil family. The de Menil family were the very powerful, if you go to the Menil collection in Houston, it's still there. Um, but they were very influential. They were collecting pop artists at the time, really um, important uh, philanthropists, collectors. And so they decided to take on, take on the commitment to help um, find commissions for this uh, pavilion. They brought on Howard Barnstone. Howard Barnstone was the architect who built the Rothko Pavilion that's there today in Houston. So they brought him on to design what would be this San Antonio Ecumenical Pavilion. And so the, there's a little postcard there from the uh, Hemisphere. Um, so they worked with the Domino family to contact several artists. The only two that we know that were invited and committed was um, Robert Indiana. He made a Love Cross painting, which is the one on the top right. It's in the Manil, Manil collection. And they had approached Andy Warhol. And so my research for this show is based off this film. And so the de Manils had contacted Warhol. Um, they, were, they fronted the money for this project. And he decided that he would make uh, a film about a sunrise or a sunset. And contacting the... Um, the Archdiocese of um, San Antonio, they were not fundraising, so the de Menil families fronted the whole, um, the whole funding for the entire project. And so that summer of 67, Warhol actually went from coast to coast, and he filmed sunsets across the country. And so he ended up, in the Warhol Museum, there's about five uh, reels of film. So there's a film from e uh, East Hampton, there's one from Long Island, there's two uh, filming across Central Park. Um, and there's also one in San Francisco, um, in Sausalito. And then there's one um, that was filmed in Chicago, um, that, but that was never completed. And so uh, Warhol mentioned this in his book, Popism, and he, he, he recalled, I filmed so many sunsets for this project, but they never satisfied me. So this idea of Warhol being religious and also thinking about this sort of um, universal you know, the moment of a sunset, um, was quite interesting. The, the project never happened. We, we don't know why. The film exists in the Warhol collection. Um, but during this period, Warhol was very involved with the Velvet Underground, if you're a fan of the Velvet Underground. So if, if you watch the film, it's about 17 minutes long. On two occasions, a jet plane flies by, the sun is setting, um, and the voice of Nico from the Velvet Underground is reciting this poem about life and death and black and white and a, a man walking on water. Um, it's really uh, evocative and it's unfortunate the film was never complete, but this was one of the focal points um, in this exhibition that I did. This was also an opportunity to talk about Warhol and his queerness. So when you visited the exhibition, you think about Warhol being a gay man. Um, Warhol has a very complicated relationship with his sexuality, but we know he was gay, we know he had lovers. He addressed, addresses his sexuality through paintings. Um, and especially in the 80s, um, during the AIDS crisis, there's been interpretations around um, his depiction of Christ. And so there's a painting here on the left, uh, Be Somebody with a Body. It's from an, uh, like maybe an ad for a bodybuilder. And then it's sort of uh, superimposed with the image of Jesus, sort of this quintessential sort of Jesus from the Last Supper um, paintings that he made. And here it's with a Richard Avedon painting. It's when Warhol was shot. Warhol was shot in 68, survived, um, always wounded, but this was an, uh, a photo he had posed with, uh, for Avedon that was ex uh, shown um, at the Brooklyn Museum. And thinking about Warhol's queerness um, and working with a dead artist like Warhol, uh, I thought about ways to work with living artists again. So at the Warhol Museum, I had an opportunity to um, have conversations with an artist named Jordan Eagles. Jordan Eagles had approached me. I've known him for many years. A lot of artists, I know artists for a long time, and it takes many years for me to work with them. So um, if there's artists out there, be patient. Um, I've known Jordan for many years. There's, I'm gonna show you some other examples, but Jordan had this idea. His work is about um, the FDA's uh, discriminatory uh, blood donation policy against um, queer people, LGBTQ plus people donating blood. And the, the policies have changed slightly, um, but what he does with his work is actually makes, um, he makes lenses out of plexi to put on top of those old school uh, projectors. And he wanted to, he makes these uh, illuminations, he calls them. 
And so he took over one of the galleries. So we've got a Raphael Madonna Warhol painting there. We've got a Skulls painting. But those are, uh, the red is actually caused from the, the blood that's actually encased in the, in the resin, because if blood dries, it turns like dark. And so we were able to do this, pull this off as a one day installation on December 1st, which is World AIDS Day. And so this was a really way, a real way to work with an artist, but also acknowledge Warhol, Warhol's own um, personal uh, sexuality. Which brings me back to contemporary artists. Uh, in the summer of 2021, I opened a show called Fantasy America. And this is a proposal that I, this is a show that I was grappling with for many years. It's a proposal that I had come up with for the Bass Museum years and years ago. It was sort of unresolved. It was, and I think even in this occasion, it's not quite how I would have wanted it. The pandemic happened, it was postponed. It opened and closed during the pandemic. Um, I was able to do a publication regardless, and most of the books actually were given away for free uh, because this was a time where we weren't even touching the mail. Um, but the book gave us an opportunity um, to respond to Warhol. Warhol did a book in 1985 called America. And in that book, the book starts, and Warhol had a lot of ghostwriters, but in the first pages of this book called America, he talks about uh, when you're growing up as a little kid, you envision what the world is like through Hollywood and through music, and there has to be like a fantasy America in your head until you actually like move and see what the, the real world is like. And so I took that phrasing fantasy America and thought about artists, um, artists today that, are, that I've been watching for a long time. And so those are the artists listed there, and you might know, know some of them. A lot of them have done very well independently, but I thought of what would happen if you were to place them all together and so to do this, I wanted to respond by also starting off with a book. So the publication, it's, it's all queer and BIPOC um, authors. Um, the designers are female designers from Pittsburgh. So again, COVID allowed me to like, let's think uh, local. Um, the book uh, includes uh, writings uh, about each of the artists in the show. But it also made me remember that the gold show that I did uh, here in 2014, and then it traveled to the Newberger Museum uh, in 2015, uh, that was the last time I did a group show. So, you know, as a curator, I think there's a lot of pizzazz and a lot of focus for curators to do solo shows. Um, but there's really something very satisfying about doing group shows because you can tell a narrative or a story with many artists, especially when you find common threads uh, between them. And so this is just a reference image of the gold show. If you saw it at the Bass Museum, that was the reference of the, the one uh, that was shown um, at the Newberger. And so thinking about uh, the Fantasy America, it wasn't just a matter of borrowing works from artists. You know, I really love to commission things. I like artists to think about how they would engage with our collection um, at the Warhol Museum. This is Nona Faustine. This is her um, My Country series. So she started off one day um, taking the ferry um, in New York, and she saw, she saw the Statue of Liberty, and she took a photograph of it. And if you know her work, there's always like this blurry barrier between herself as a black woman, but also whatever she's um, focused on it, which tends to be uh, national monuments. And so for this particular uh, body of work, it's the first time she did silkscreen. So she's a, she's a photographer, but she actually uh, grew up loving Andy Warhol and so and pop. And so she actually made silkscreens. Um, but also the one on the far bottom right is, um, is one of Donald Trump during the election. And so she was basically um, in shock watching the TV and she photographed this moment. And so the image itself and when you take a photograph of like a TV, you'll get bars across it. And so she, she emphasizes that, but she also transitioned from uh, black to red lines. Um, but all of these works are placed on Andy Warhol. Uh, he, he designed a, a Washington Monument wallpaper. So you see this sort of black and white uh, illustration. That's actually a wallpaper that Warhol had sketched based off his own photographs um, from going to DC. It also included uh, Kambuyo Olajime. It included... Um, Chloe Weiss. Chloe Weiss is an artist who mostly is known for her painting. She's not quite known for her films, um, but we made this carpeted sort of theater um, and with these benches and videos. Uh, another artist there to the right, Pacifico Solano. Uh, he actually took two Dennis Hopper paintings from the Warhol collection, um, looking at <clears throat> notions of masculinity and how they relate to his work. And so we, we sort of paired them together. And so all the artists were basically responding to their America, their personal America. Um, all the artists were also based, are still all based in New York. You know, so Warhol graduated college. He went to Carnegie Mellon University, graduated, went to New York, never, never came back. And so the idea of these young artists in New York City finding their own, um, their own path in the, on the same footprint of Warhol was really intriguing to me and to see what, how artists are responding to America today. 
we also have an opportunity to um, have a performance. This is during the, la the latter part of the pandemic. Nama Sabar, who um, she had a show at the Basque Museum, uh, I guess a year or so ago. Um, but this was her first performance uh, since the pandemic, or this was during the pandemic. And so it was an another opportunity to bring people back. That's something I think about a lot in my current position, which I'll get to. But when I left the Bass Museum, I also had left behind many projects. And some of them ha happened, and you saw them. And I was not involved after I had left Miami. Um, but some of the artists said, hey, we're not done talking. Let's, let's get the band back together and come up with something. So Paola Peavy, Italian artist based in Anchorage, Alaska, we continued to have those conversations. She was making a book uh, with Justine Ludwig, who was the curator at, uh, at the show at the Bass Museum. And so as we started to talk, she's known for her feathered polar bears, if you've seen those or if you saw the show at the Bass Museum. But we said, well, let's rethink this. What can, how can we make this unique to Pittsburgh, make it unique to uh, responding to our collection? And so we started to talk. And if you've seen photographs of Andy Warhol or have been to the Andy Warhol Museum, um, there's this famous red couch. Um, it's, it's a couch that no one knows where he got it from. It ended up missing. Um, but in our lobby, we have sort of reproduction of it. So she has a series of miniature furniture pieces that are drenched in perfume. And so uh, she made a replica of this miniature. Um, these are sort of behind the scenes. Um, so she made a miniature version of this Warhol couch that you could smell. Um, and then the image on the right, we decided to come up with a project uh, dedicated to shoes, which I'll get to in one second. And we also talked about Warhol and his involvement in the world of design, the idea of seriality. And so we, we created these. Um, these stacked mattresses, they actually look like they're floating. You could actually crawl inside of them and sort of lounge. And they're positioned in, in a vantage point where you could sit in them and see the whole entire show just from uh, lounging and laying about uh, in, in the gallery space. And the main, the main project for this show was this shoe project. And so what you're looking at is the final installation. So you saw the earlier uh, image of this. Um, but what, what we decided to do is we asked as many people as we knew from everywhere from as far as India to Italy to Miami. There was participants here to, to Pittsburgh. And so we asked uh, individuals to wear a pair of shoes for as long as possible, for like six months to a year, wear a pair of shoes, and we're going to uh, acquire a matching pair. Or we would even buy, all, we'd buy two pairs of shoes and just send the shoes to someone else. And so what you're seeing here is uh, hundreds of pairs of shoes the worn pair and the unworn pair. And Paola really talked about how, with this exhibition, um, we all wear shoes. And so the idea of shoes, it's about personal identity. She thinks of it as a diary of our life. If you look at someone, the bottom of someone's shoes, the wear and tear, um, the socioeconomical aspects of shoes, you know, designer shoes. Some of these shoes had very little value and um, were probably the best shoes that the person could have worn. We had shoes from drag queens. We had shoes, shoes that basically defined someone's profession, shoes that were more uh, out of fashion. And so we were able to um, reunite them all together and put them as sort of one installation. And so the idea was to commission this so that one day it could go to another museum or, or she could expand um, upon the project. Um, we had uh, done this uh, prior, talked about this for many uh, years, but she wasn't quite able to figure out how we could communicate with so many people, but with the pandemic, it was easy to ship things. It was easy to have sort of point people in the different cities, and we were able to um, install this. And so I think Typo was actually here uh, in the room, as many of you know Typo. Um, but working at the Warhol Museum, I was there for six years, um, but I always gravitated. Uh, I've always, I always come back to um, contemporary artists. So working with Paola was my last uh, contemporary show at the Warhol, but there was an opportunity to work on public art. And so with generous funny from grants, I was able to line up artists. Um, I was interested in Miami artist Michael Loveland is here. He also did a project. Um, but the first project we did was we were able to find, identify a wall at the museum and create a, a mural. And so now the museum is defining sort of a new arts district. Um, but an opportunity to also work with artists who um, you can uplift their practice. I didn't look for an artist who had never made a mural. I love working with artists who do what they do, uh, and that's like uh, natural for them. Um, I love working with experts when I work on exhibitions, and I'll get to that uh, uh, around my work at the Seattle Art Museum, is I, d I don't have to be the expert in anything. I don't have to have my name on the wall when you walk into an exhibition. So if we're doing an exhibition around uh, costumes and fashion, we'll, we'll work with that expert. If we're going to work uh, with someone who's 
uh, makes incredible murals, then I'll work with someone who does that. And so it's really important for me to have these lasting relationships with artists because it really makes me think about the sort of the younger years of my time here in Miami. So I'm using this slide to sort of transition us back, back to Miami. And so many of you have seen this um, neon sign uh, at the Bass Museum. It's one of the projects I had worked on. So if you think about the Bass Museum, and you know, years and years ago, it had the, the partnership with, the, um, with um, Art Basel Miami Beach. So there would always be this sculpture park initiative, and the Bass Museum would uh, help supplement that, help manage it, help tour it, uh, work with the artists, work with Art Basel and their guest curator. But then there was always opportunities to originate projects. And so this project, Sylvie Fleury, a Trinity Now, um, and many of you have seen this, it's based off, she was flying on a plane to Miami, she was looking through the duty-free catalog, and so it's based off the Eterni Eternity Now font um, and color of, uh, of the bottle, but then she thought about Art Deco, she thought about how the neon sign faces the ocean and how that's eternity. Um, it was a very complicated relationship. Um, we're, we're good friends now, but it was a very painful uh, experience in terms of like budgets and you know getting uh, logistics lined up but it happened it's up and the museum ended up acquiring it but it made me think about my my interest in public art it's always been there um, I'm not so much focused to just being inside um, the gallery space and that's one thing I think that makes me a little bit different than other museum curators I found this image I I, I don't think it's uh, it's hard to find on the internet but uh, Catherine Andrews uh, is an artist, and she was responding to um, the Bass Museum's birthday. Um, there's a lot of works of hers, I think, at the De La Cruz collection. Um, but she made a custom banner. There was a banner project. This is a site of the Bass Museum before its renovation. But working at the Bass Museum, I was really allowed to you know, uh, come up with ideas that really supported. I, I think the museum is big enough or small enough to allow experimentation. I was also able to do a performance with the team uh, with a South African artist, Athi Pataruga. Um, this was a project that I had really advocated for. Um, and I just remember fondly when I was um, uh, in Venice with Sylvia Cubinha, uh, the director at the Bass, also a mentor. Uh, we were in Venice and there was a party. Um, it was for the, like an African pavilion party and we couldn't get in. And so we decided just to like go around the block and maybe grab dinner. And I saw the artist and his entourage, they're all covered in balloons. And so I recognized uh, the artist and his team and they said, oh, come with us. So we ended up sneaking back into the actual party uh, and got right in. But the performance is so incredible and so moving um, that Sylvia was convinced that it would be perfect uh, for Miami. And it was performed at the public library. This was during the renovation period. Again, thinking outside the box um, was a challenge that we had to uh, wrap our heads around, but Athi was able to perform at the library and then performed at, I think, one of the galas um, that was done there. So that was in uh, 2016, but prior to all that, you know, I'm, I'm from Miami, so um, my, parents, my parents are both Mexican. My father grew up in Hialeah. His sister married a, a Cuban man, so um, a lot of people think that I'm Cuban, but my parents, now there's lots of Mexican people in Homestead, but my father grew up here in like the, um, in the 70s, in the late 60s and the 70s. And so, um, you know, Lori had mentioned I worked at MAM back in the day. This was like a long time ago in downtown. I knew all the team. I was not a curator then. Um, I mostly worked in education. Um, but after, work, after um, doing some other things, which I'll get to in my early days, I had relocated to uh, Liverpool, England, and so uh, going to Liverpool, England proved to be really challenging. I had moved there. I didn't know anybody. Um, my husband is here in front of me. He was, he's an oceanographer. He still lives here, so I come back and forth uh, to Miami. But we had moved to Liverpool, England for almost, uh, close to five years. And so there's actually um, there's a Liverpool biennial. And so it's a, the only biennial in the UK, but it's in Liverpool. Uh, Liverpool is a port city. It has a very... Um, powerful and painful history uh, because of the transatlantic slave trade. It was a very wealthy city, at one point the wealthiest city in the world. Um, but because of that, there's a lot of museums there. And so the T Tate Liverpool is there. Um, Henry Tate uh, had, I guess, patented the sugar cube and made his fortune. Um, but the reason there's the Tate there is because Liverpool was um, so prosperous and there is other museums and, and the biennial is there. And so living there, I, I decided to do my master's after not finding work for a long time. Um, so I did a master's at the University of Liverpool in um, material culture and um, or cultural history, but thinking about cultural history and these are the histories of things that are not, they're not political histories, but now we see lots of uh, great, you know, cultural history books and exhibitions, whether it's about um, 
fashion or, you know, trends in the Victorian era or ripperology or, you know, there's lots of interesting things in ter terms of, like, material culture. But one thing, if you think about the things I've showed you from the Warhol Museum, I love mixing, thing I love mixing things all up. I love to see a film next to a magazine, next to a painting. Um, most of my projects are not just painting or not just sculpture. I like to mix medium, so it's, not, it's multidisciplinary. It's not just a, a painter show. It's not just a sculpture show. Um, it could be immersive. It could have different aspects. And so um, from, studying in, from studying Liverpool, I was also able to find opportunities um, to work at Tate Liverpool, for example. Um, this is a project. This was uh, Doug Aitken. It was a project called The Source. And so it's a pavilion that was built. It was designed by David Age. And so inside the pavilion, you had these um, interviews with very famous people like Devander Bernhardt, uh, um, Beck, um, um, Tilda Swinton, as you see her there. And so this idea of the, talking about the source of creativity, but I was a, a project coordinator, so I wasn't curating any of this. I worked with the curators, but to, to build this, um, I'm a very hands-on curator. I think that's something that Miami curators and artists know how to do. They know how to roll up their sleeves and get their hands dirty. I work with a lot of snooty curators and artists, or have, and I think that's one of the greatest assets of Miami uh, creative individuals is just to sort of get your hands dirty. So for this project, I was flying in um, technicians. I was helping find certain bolts that were required to piece together this temporary uh, pavilion. But really, working sort of back of house is something that I really um, enjoy on these projects. And that was in 2012, but the biennial before that was 2010. This was uh, sort of my first job in the arts in Liverpool. Uh, this was the a biennial. Uh, it had a curator, but the, the biennial in Liverpool, it's a citywide biennial, so you can go to different buildings. And so it, um, in an old, um, like a, an old tool shop, they had a lot of exhibitions with many artists that you would recognize. And I found these pictures the other day. They're, they're deep on the internet, uh, but I found them. And so I was hired as a, as a project coordinator um, to work with Tony Bruguera. We had brought... Um, uh, artists from Cuba, so they were being brought to Liverpool. Uh, one, one aspect of the project was re to recreate two dozen Alan Capro happenings. So Alan Capro is an artist who basically dictated on writing, like, oh, you're going to do this simple action, and it's a happening. And so Tanya was, Tanya was able to select all the happenings that she wanted all these artists uh, to do. Um, Carlos Martiel was one of them. Hamlet La Vista that was another one. A lot of artists you know today were, um, I had helped get their visas and travel and apartment. Perdium. A lot of the artists had never left Cuba. Some of them never went back. Um, but working with Tanya was uh, such an incredible uh, experience, and, and I can call her a friend today. Uh, but from this experience, this was an Alan Caprao piece um, from 1968 called Transfer. The idea is to take like 50 empty oil drums, um, put them on a truck, relocate them in one part of the city or one, another location, stack them up, paint them or spray paint them, stand on them triumphantly, uh, roll them to another location. And so I, ha I was the person who had to actually find all these oil drums. And so I had to like take a bus and go to a place and explain that this was for an art project. Um, but I also, because we needed manpower, I also had to help um, activate uh, this work. So this is myself and people rolling these through uh, uh, downtown Liverpool. Um, but also it, towards the end, we rolled them into a beautiful historical building, St. George's Hall. And un un unbeknownst to the city or even the biennial, the day that this happened, Tanya just said, we're doing it. We're not doing permits. We're just going to make it happen. So we rolled the barrels into the uh, St. George's Hall, which was where the press, the press preview was happening. And that's why you have like, a little bit of plastic on the bottom, but people were not happy with us. Um, but it really showed sort of the roots of my sort of, uh, interest and engagement with working with artists, but also being very much uh, involved in that process. And that takes me back to the Wormhole Lab. So Wormhole Lab, uh, it's, uh, it's an apartment project that I had. Um, so I used to live on 22nd in Biscayne. Uh, other artists lived in that building. That's an old picture of me. Uh, my apartment was on the right side. And so I had moved into this apartment. And um, I had just finished an internship at the Rubel Collection, or the Rubel Museum, as it's called now. And um, I think a response to the gentrification, the expanding art scene was uh, frustration, and so uh, the frustration of just wanting to be part of that. And so um, I work with several artists. Here's an image of a work by Diego Sin uh, on the left. It's a mural. This show was called Haunted, this idea of like a haunted house. 
Um, the apartment was empty, didn't have any furniture. Um, but spending hours in the space with all these artists, I know Pepe's here, Cristina Le Rodriguez is here. Um, this is her sculpture on the right. But this idea of being able to cultivate um, or take advantage of the, of the blossoming art scene, but also make a response to it. And from this, I was able to be invited to use retail spaces. Um, I was able to co-curate something at the Moore space with Nina Arias, um, borrow things from different collections. And it really was important in you know, learning how to do things from scratch. And really, the, the origins of all of this is working at the Rubel Museum, or the Rubel Collection, as it was called then. This is 2003. It was like 20 years ago, um, but the Rubel Collection used to have a curatorial internship. Um, they would have like a cohort of like three young people at a time from different parts of the world, and um, many of many people have changed careers entirely. Some of them are still in the arts, um, but doing this, uh, working, uh, interning at the Rubel Collection, it's um, an opportunity to basically pick a project. And so I had picked um, Jenny Holzer as my project, and so I got to install her work. I got to work with the studio. Um, at the time, she was based in Florida. I don't know if she's still based in Florida. Um, but we were able to put her um, inflammatory essays in this wall. The truisms are on the right. Um, I had proposed to the city of Miami Beach to put truisms along Lincoln Road. It was, it was denied and declined. I think maybe they would change their mind today. But it was done on a very scrappy level. And, maybe, and the Rubel Collection is so internationally known today. Um, but part of this experience was like you had to make the labels, do the press release, pick up the artists in the airport, do the tours, um, document the show. And so working there really demystified the curatorial process. And I think it's hard to know what curators do. You know, I, I meet so many curators myself, and it's hard to know which curators actually um, do their own research or book their own Zoom links. You know, a lot of curators um, work differently, and different, different museums have, have ways of doing things. But I really pride myself in being hands-on and involved in projects. And so, and then thinking about the cities that I live in, I've always lived sort of like cities on the water. Pittsburgh has three rivers. It's not very uh, as glamorous as Miami, but Liverpool is on the water, Miami's on the water, and Seattle is on the water. So um, if there's any clues to where I'll end up next, um, it might be somewhere on the water. I've always known that one day I'd want to be a director of a museum. So I'm slowly, um, I don't want to say phasing out, but when I, after being at the Warhol for six years, I knew I wanted to leave the Midwest. I knew I didn't want to go to the South, deep South. Um, but this opportunity is really uh, a great one. This is an image of the Olympic Sculpture Park in Seattle. That's an Alexander Calder sculpture. Um, the Seattle Art Museum has three sites. So now I'm the deputy director for art. So I manage three sites. I manage the, the curator, curatorial team, but all the artistic programming across three sites. So the Sculpture Park is about 10 acres. There's like two dozen artworks, Teresita Fernandez, uh, Marc de Suvereau, um, Louise Bourgeois, um, there's a Juan Plenza. Uh, you can go on their website and check them all out. Um, but it also has uh, the Asian Art Museum, which is sort of a jewel box building. It's kind of like, it's kind of like uh, it, well, it is Art Deco. It has sort of this oriental, orientalist um, elements to it, these camels on the left and right. Um, this is the original Seattle Art Museum. So the Seattle Art Museum started off, um, it's in Volunteer Park, which is an Olmsted design park. But the museum itself, it, it, we just celebrated our 90th anniversary. But it, it started off collecting uh, Asian, so strengths in Korean, Japanese, Chinese art. And so I work with about eight curators of all disciplines that are specialists in Chinese art, American art, African art. And so when you walk through these building, through the, each collection, um, there really is focal points on these specialties. Um, this is just a close-up of our downtown gallery. This is the main building. It's a Venturi-designed um, structure, it's several, uh, it's a very large uh, building. And so now I've gone from doing exhibitions that are like 4,000 square feet to like 10,000 square feet. And so moving to this, moving to Seattle, you know, I work with curators and, but I knew that I didn't want to stop curating. You know, there's sort of a point, I've talked to other directors that at some point you have to be ready to say goodbye to that, especially if you no longer want to just be a curator. And so um, when I was at the Warhol Museum, I became a chief curator. And so now I have this new role. So thinking about, uh, what I'll work on. But one thing that's different here is I, I manage curators, but I also have to manage the whole or come up with the whole program. And so that's been sort of a new challenge. Um, I collaborate with curators, artists, museums. Um, but as I mentioned, I love working with the different expertise uh, that I have access to. And so one of the first sort of marching orders that I had was to basically f start filling up the calendar. That's something that's exciting, very frightening. Um, but I also I started a year and three months ago, and so I was hired by Amada Cruz. You might have met her in one of the previous talks. Um, 
she resigned. She's going to the Santa Barbara Museum of Art like in a week, so she's leaving. So I was really uh, not prepared for that. So everything I was hired to do took a shift because I've been working on so many other things. And a lot of my role now as a curator is really administrative, it's managing, managing people. Um, but also, as you can see across three sites, I had worked at the Warhol Museum, which is four museums. So again, it has sort of this um, multi-campus sort of f f flavor to it. Um, and working at Tate as well, it has four, there's four Tates. So I think I have sort of found my wheelhouse in terms of the kind of institution I want to work at. And so uh, the very first show that I chose for the calendar, which opens in like two weeks, um, is a Hokusai exhibition. And so there's an install image. I got here a few days ago, but the image on the left is from last Friday. Um, we were building and starting to unpack crates. Um, this is a Hokusai show from MFA Boston. And so Hokusai, of course, you might know him for The Great Wave, or everyone may not know his name, but that's the, the artist who um, uh, made uh, that image. And you think of like these uh, single artists, you know, great master painters. They always tend to be Western. And so part of my, part of my job at the museum is finding, um, not finding, but, but um, onboarding exhibitions that will appeal to the people of Seattle. And so you know, this, this initial exhibition, it's the first one I put on the calendar, but there's sort of an assumption if you're going to work with an Asian artist like Hokusai, why wouldn't, why wouldn't it open at the Asian Art Museum? And so I decided to move to have it at the main downtown museum as sort of a splashy statement, because if there was a Leonardo da Vinci show, of course it'll be downtown, but why couldn't it be somewhere else? And so right now we have a, a show with uh, Toulouse-Lautrec that's at the Asian Art Museum, sort of swapping roles, and we have a Hokusai that's gonna open. So I'm, I'm the organizing curator, so it already has an expert who's written the catalog and written many books on Japanese Edo period prints. Um, but this exhibition is really interesting, and the reason I chose it is because it includes contemporary artists, so it talks about uh, the impact of Hokusai as a, as a printmaker, as a painter. It looks at, historically, uh, looks at his peers, his students, but then looks at the impact of Japanism, so it has lots of European and American decorative arts. Um, but then throughout the whole show, there's um, contemporary art, so artists who have directly or indirectly responded to Hokusai, whether it's The Great Wave or other works. Um, I included an image that I like, and since it's, since it's October, um, this is the mansion of the plates. Uh, this is an old myth of a maidservant who had accidentally broke a plate, and the master of the house uh, was going to punish her, so it's said that she either threw herself down a well or was pushed down a well for breaking the plate. And so Hokusai was very um, evocative in creating this sort of ghost-like figure made out of the porcelain plates. Um, so just showing the range of things that Hokusai could do from landscape to taking on like the supernatural. So this show is going to open on October 17th. Uh, if you find yourself uh, coming to uh, Seattle, it'll be on view. But it's, it's basically um, when I started the Warhol, uh, the Seattle Art Museum, our curator of Japanese art left to the Philadelphia Museum. So I purposely, purposely chose this show, but uh, I almost see the show as um, relying on the expertise of the Bo MFA Boston. But also when I work on exhibitions, a checklist is a checklist, shipping is shipping. Um, you know, um, a lot of the logistics are pretty much the same on any type of show. And then last April, this is like sort of the first show I'm curating as my own um, in Seattle. Last April, we received a gift of uh, approximately 50 Calder sculptures. And so you saw the big giant one in the park. That, that family has gifted us an endowment of $10 million plus like 50, art, 50 plus artworks, I should say, uh, made by Calder. And so for this uh, initial or inaugural exhibition, we're working with um, the Calder Foundation, so they're sort of the stamp of approval. Um, they offer us guidance. And so this exhibition opens November 7th, so I'm working on the, both of the, the image on the bottom right, that was from last week, that are painting uh, the gallery, so I'm actually installing two shows at the same time. Um, but I'm really excited because it's sort of my sort of introduction uh, to Seattle. The image on the top left, I mentioned I love working with exhibition designers. We have an in-house exhibition design team uh, at the Seattle Art Museum. Uh, at the Warhol Museum, I would always bake it into the budget, because I was like, my shows, I would always want to have um, exhibition designers instead of just having uh, flat walls. And so the inspiration for this exhibition design is thinking about Calder, but thinking about uh, undulating lines, thinking about how can, how can the space be whimsical without impacting the art, so the walls will remain white. Um, there's also three overlooks uh, on, on this floor, so basically, audiences will be, will be able to look from above down on the show, which is not typical of Calder, especially since a lot of the sculptures are meant to be looked at um, in 360 degrees. But also, I'm trying to mimic um, the collection of this family. So the, this family, they have a spectacular home. 
they live with all this art. And a lot of the works that Calder made, they weren't necessarily made, and a lot of the works I guess we have in our own homes, you know, um, not everything's made for a museum, so thinking about the intimacy of Calder, Calder himself would make small works or make works as gifts, and so trying to mimic the intimacy of um, encountering objects, um, but also responding to one another. These are just two examples of mobiles in this collection. There's going to be um, a catalog that's going to print, I think, tomorrow. Um, the exhibition will be on view uh, for nine months. So if you, again, if you find yourself in Seattle, um, this is something to uh, consider as a highlight. But also, um, this is a call. This is one of Calder's. Uh, he made several dozen um, mobiles that actually make sound. So you'll see this is actually a. Uh, that's a brass gong, and the thing with Calder is like they're meant to move, they're kinetic, but you can't put a fan on them, you're not supposed to you know, blow on them. And so I'm hoping with the show, and it's hopefully it's popular, um, the, the space itself will be activated, things will be moving. Um, I've never, I've been to this house many times to see this works, but um, I've never heard it make a gong sound, so I have wishful thinking of what it could possibly sound like. And so, in terms of the Seattle Art Museum, it made me really reflect on the things I showed you today, this interest in sort of research-focused, uh, populist, maximalist, um, but also you know, juxtaposing the old and the new, um, thinking about uh, rethinking space, and so whether it's inside or outdoors. I'm also working on some public projects for the Seattle Art Museum, uh, yet soon to be announced. Um, but also collaboration. I think the, the arts should be collaborative. I know there's a lot of... Um, barriers in the art world. I know it's very hard for artists to access curators. We, we're, sort of, we're in these ivory towers, which I don't think should exist. Um, but I think museums are here for the people. And I, I think since the pandem pandemic, since the murder of George Floyd, I think museums are, many are actively and successfully evolving. And I think, I, and I think the Seattle Art Museum is doing that. I'm, a, I'm someone who wants to be part of that change. But I understand the challenges that come with um, museum, the museum field. And so with that, I'm going to wrap it up. And um, I know we're supposed to get nibbles and drinks now, and I encourage you to say hello. But thank you, everyone, for having me here tonight. Thank you, Locust Projects.